Hey everyone, welcome back to Virtualization How To. And today I'm diving into my latest project, a Proxmox home server build for 2025. We'll cover why I chose Proxmox, the flexibility this build offers, including even compatibility with VMware, and why building your own server might be better than using a mini PC. Plus, I'll walk you through all of the components that I've chosen for this powerful build. So let's get started. And now a word about the sponsor of today's video. Today's video is sponsored by Nakivo. Are you looking for a powerful and reliable backup solution for your home lab or enterprise environment? Look no further than Nakivo Backup and Replication. Nakivo is an excellent data protection software that offers comprehensive backup and recovery options and lets you use your NAS or a simple VM deployment as a backup appliance. Nakivo supports a wide range of environments, including Proxmox VE, VMware, Hyper-V, Nutanix, KVM, and EC2 instances, along with SaaS platforms like Microsoft 365. Plus, they offer a free version for up to 10 VMs, and that makes it an ideal choice for both home lab setups and enterprise backups. So why Proxmox? Well, for many of us in the home lab community, Proxmox has become the go-to platform for virtualization and containers. Thanks to Broadcom discontinuing the ESXi free edition and adding certification requirements, for VMUG Advantage access, Proxmox is really a no-brainer at this point. It's free, it's open source, and it's incredibly versatile. Now, what I love about Proxmox is that it's perfect for running both virtual machines and containers. If you're diving into Kubernetes or exploring containerized applications, Proxmox gives you the flexibility to do all of those things in a single platform. Now, you may be wondering, Will this build run VMware if you so choose in the future? Well, the answer is yes. There's nothing in this build that is exclusive to Proxmox. In fact, the Intel 10 gig Ethernet card that I've included has drivers for VMware ESXi. So if Broadcom changes their licensing strategy and makes VMware more accessible once again, you have that flexibility to switch. So this build is all about keeping your options open. Now let's talk about why I decided to build my own Proxmox server instead of just buying a mini PC, which is what I've traditionally done in my home lab, especially over the past couple of years. Well, mini PCs like the Minisform MS-01 are fantastic. They're compact, they're energy efficient, and they're ready to go out of the box, which definitely gives you some advantages there. And with the forthcoming Minisform MS-A2 that has fantastic hardware specs and is really an upgrade from the MS-01, it's a hard sell sometimes to think about building your own server. But let's talk about a few of the advantages. Well, first of all, with the 2U rack case, you get significantly more space for storage and upgrades. For example, adding multiple drives or higher end network cards is much easier in a larger case. And you also get better airflow and heat dissipation, which means that your hardware is likely going to last longer compared to the cramped environment of a mini PC. Another consideration is expandability. While many PCs like the MS-01 or the forthcoming MSA2 include PCIe slots, their small form factor limits the types of cards that you can install. With this build, I'm using a full-size case and a reinforced PCIe slot thanks to the Minis Forum motherboard that I'm using for the build. And this gives me the flexibility to upgrade to perhaps a 25 gig network card down the road or something else. Now though, let's talk about the core of this build. And that is the Minis Forum BD795M motherboard. And that sports the AMD Ryzen 9 7945HX processor. Now this processor is fantastic. It includes 16 cores and 32 threads. And so it delivers incredible performance for things like virtualization, running containers, and other workloads. Plus this combo actually has the CPU installed. So it eliminates any possibility of damaging your CPU as you try to get it installed to the motherboard as some of these AM5 CPUs as well as the heat sinks can certainly be tedious to install. Now this particular motherboard features dual M.2 NVMe slots, DDR5 support up to 96 gigs, and a reinforced PCIe slot for high-end cards. 
Mini's Forum emphasizes its low power consumption, low heat output, and high cost to performance ratio, which all of those checks the right boxes when it comes to running a home lab server, perhaps 24 by 7 by 365. Let's quickly run through the rest of the components that I've chosen for this particular build. For the case, I'm using the Rack Choice 2U Micro ATX Rack Mount Case. It's compact, it supports ATX power supplies, and it offers excellent airflow. And to be quite honest, the way I stumbled onto this case was after looking at the Minis Forum motherboard on Amazon's website, as you guys know, there are recommended components that others have bought with this particular hardware, and this 2U Rack Choice server case popped up as a recommended item, and it has really good reviews, and it's one of Amazon's recommended cases. Now, also for the power supply, I have decided on the Cooler Master MWE Gold 850 V2, and it's a fully modular power supply supply, it's efficient, it's reliable, it's got the gold uh, efficiency standard, and it was relatively inexpensive. For cooling, I'm using the Noctua NH-L9A AM5 low profile cooler, which you will need with this motherboard combination if you're fitting it into a case like a 2U server case for rack mount. Now for RAM, I went with a crucial 96 gigabyte DDR5 kit for maximum memory capacity. And that's the largest amount you can get currently with sodium memory capacity. However, as many of you know, if you follow me on the VHT forums, I posted a quick blurb. Crucial is set to release 64 gigabyte dense sodium modules, meaning perhaps that we will soon, at least in 2025 at some point, have the ability to possibly push our mini PCs and some of these platforms up to 128 gigs of memory. And that is something that so far we have not been able to do up to this point. That will be fantastic. Now for networking, I've chosen the Intel X520 DA2 10 gig ethernet card that is nothing really special. You can get drivers for Windows, Linux, VMware, and many other operating systems. So it's a good choice when it comes to having networking that will be compatible regardless of what you decide to install as your hypervisor on this particular server build. Now, when it comes to storage, I went super cheap on the boot drive. I'm looking at the Kingston 240 gig SSD. I've used these particular drives in the past when moving some ESXi servers away from SD cards for boot when we went to vSphere 7, and they actually held up really well, and they are super cheap. A 240 gig SSD will cost you around $24. For the the data drive, however, where my VMs will be running, I chose the Samsung Evo 990 Pro 2 terabyte NVMe SSD for blazing fast performance. And I've been seeing a lot of deals lately, at least that pop in on the headlines, where you can get four terabyte Samsung Evo 990 Pros for a tremendous discount. So keep your eyes open for those types of deals. However, I think two terabytes for me to get started with this build is going to be sufficient. So I'm logged into the BIOS of the Minis Forum BD795M motherboard in my Proxmox server build. And underneath the advanced settings, I want to show you guys a couple of interesting configuration settings that you want to take note of. Under the AMD CBS functionality, you can navigate to the CPU common options. And here I wanted to show you guys that the core performance boost is set to auto and the only other option there is disabled. Now I want to show you when I go back to the advanced and hardware monitor, I'm going to show you guys how things are running. So I've got a CPU temperature of around 85, 87 degrees and that bumps up and down depending on when the CPU kicks in. So fairly hot CPU temperature. However, at this setting with that core performance boost set to auto, the power draw even at idle is also quite high uh, at around 90 watts to 100 watts, somewhere in there. However, once I disabled this setting or just set it to disabled from auto and we're going to save that, I'm gonna save and exit and I'll show you guys the difference that makes. So now if I go back, I've rebooted from changing that particular setting. And if I go back to the advanced, and hardware monitor, you can see the CPU temperature is literally half 
And the same story is true for the power draw where I was at 90 to 100 watts. Once I changed that setting, we're down to like 40 watts, 45 watts, somewhere in there. So do keep that in mind. Another awesome thing that I think many are going to enjoy about not only this board and processor, but, but also the upcoming minis forum MSA2 is that if you scroll down and we go to the AMD PBS configuration. Here's where we can configure the PCIe slot. Now, one of the things that we know that we did not have with the Minis Forum MS-01 was bifurcation. However, I'm pleasantly pleased to say and show you guys that this slot configuration we can take from an X16 to an 8x8, an 8x4x4, or a 4x4x4x4. So that is probably going to interest many as it's going to open up a lot of possibilities on how we use that PCIe slot, most likely as well in the upcoming Minis Forum MSA2. So here we're logged into Proxmox and I wanted to show you guys, we've got 32 logical processors showing inside of Proxmox, which is awesome. I've never seen that in my home lab in a Proxmox installation that I have with home lab hardware. So this just shows you the processing power of this combination. So here I have the Linux stress utility with the STUI graphical interface to run that utility loaded directly into Proxmox. And with the core performance boost turned off on the Ryzen 7945HX processor, the power draw is 68 watts, which is extremely respectable, especially for 32 threads. Now with it turned on, that jumps dramatically to 148.8 watts. So a tremendous difference when you have that turned off or on when it comes to the power consumption in your home lab environment. So I'm quite pleased with how this build turned out. Everything worked. I didn't have a single item that didn't work out of the box in the build or any incompatibility issues. The CPU, of course, was already pre-installed with this BD795M motherboard from Minis Forum, which made life a lot easier. I got the CPU cooler installed. I got the 10 gig card course the PSU, I've got the Kingston SSD, and then an NVMe drive. With the exception, I only have 32 gigs of memory slotted in at the moment as I wait on my 96 gig kit to arrive. But other than that, everything came out fantastic. This is going to be an absolute workhorse in the home lab environment. Very happy with the way things turned out. I would love to have a three node configuration with this setup. Now I've also started a thread, as I mentioned earlier, on virtualization how-to forums. I'm documenting this build process and I would love to hear your thoughts. Are you planning perhaps a Proxmox build this year or are you sticking with mini PCs or something else? Let me know in the comments or join the forum discussion and follow along as I build out my new Proxmox server and let you guys know anything that I come up with along the way. Well, that's it for today's video with this Proxmox build for 2020. 25. If you're interested in any of the components I've mentioned, check out the links in the description. They are Amazon affiliate links, which means I do get a very small commission if you choose to buy the components based on those links. But I've got those all together, so it's nice and neat if you want to put this same type of package together for a Proxmox server build. And if you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, to subscribe, and hit that bell icon for more home lab content. Well, I really appreciate you watching. Please do stay safe out there, keep on home labbing, and I will see you in the next video.